Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Unzan Chitta. The Buddha was not ordained. That may elicit a response of, hmm, I never thought of that, or, well, duh, or, Possibly in that same snarky way, who would have ordained him anyway? All valid. But the person that we consider to be the founder of our, if you want to say, religion, uh, was not actually ordained in it or any other religion. Fair enough, that's not, you know the only time that's happened. Uh, I think any of the uh, uh, three Abrahamic faiths could, you know, say the same thing. But it's interesting because in Zen, we put this premium on achievement or education or level of practice. Um, you know, there are some schools that unless you've sat in 1200 hours worth of retreats, they won't even talk to you as far as, you know, any sort of uh, Dharma scenario, transmission, Inca, whatever it might be. We know that the, the Buddha story was that he was born wealthy and encountered birth, old age, sickness and death. Well, old age, sickness and death anyway. Um, and that was a real game changer for, for him because he saw that what he was exposed to in his own little world in the palace did not constitute all of reality. In fact, other than of itself, the amount of reality it rep represented was minuscule. So he went off on his quest and he was searching for the answer to this discomfort he was feeling and uh, eventually he came up with the answer. And so he moved on and shared what he found to be the answer, which we refer to as the Dharma. And he attracted some followers, first among the uh, five ascetics that he had been um, working with um, prior to his going off and uh, actually finding the answer he was looking for, waking up. And I, I kind of imagine the five of them seeing this not quite as emaciated Buddha and thinking, oh, well, old Gautama fell off the wagon, so I guess we can be nice to him and, and maybe show him the way again. But as it turns out, he showed them the way and he became uh, their, the teacher to his first five disciples or monks, if you want to call them that. Um, as time went on and there was like 1250 monks sitting in the audience hearing the teachings of the Dharma, you know, it was no longer just a bunch of guys who were hanging out and listened to this other guy speak. They lived together, they lived under the rules of the Vinaya, 
So in that regard, you could say they were ordained. There are a number of other occasions throughout the history of Zen and Buddhism where you would think that ordination or level of ordination would mean something. And sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, much in the same way as the Buddha relinquished his life of leisure, uh, we know of Lehman Pong, who was in the Tang Dynasty and uh, basically he relinquished all of his possessions to study um, sutras and work with teachers uh, such as Ji Dao and uh, Matsu. And uh, let me just read you this little bit about uh, our friend Layman Pang. Layman was sitting in his thatched cottage one day, studying the sutras. Difficult, difficult, he said, like trying to scatter 10 measures of sesame seed all over a tree. Easy, easy, Mrs. Pong said like touching your feet to the ground when you get out of bed. The daughter, Ling Zhao, said, neither difficult nor easy. On the hundred grass tips, the great master's meaning. After Pang had retired from his profession, he said to have begun to worry about the spiritual dangers of his wealth. So he placed all of his possessions in a boat and then sank them in a river. Conversely, we also have another person from the sutras that Layman Pong may have read about. And his scenario was very different from Layman Tang's or the Buddha's in that he was a very successful merchant and he continued to be a very su su successful merchant. Uh, his name was Vimalakirti and he wasn't ordained. He wasn't a bodhisattva per se. Um, he had no title attached to his name at all. And the Vimalakirti Nirdesa Sutra is one of my favorites for a number of levels, uh, not the least of which is that it's, it's really interesting uh, prose. Uh, some of the scenarios in there are, are just totally fantastic and almost science fiction-like in their images. Uh, and on the other hand, it shows a lot about the Dharma, its practice, and who practices it. So uh, I'm gonna read a little bit to you from uh, the chapter, Initiation into the Non-Dual Dharma. At that time, Vimalakirti said to the Bodhisattvas present, virtuous ones, each of you please say something about the non-dual Dharma as you understand it. In the meeting, a Bodhisattva called Comfort in the Dharma said, virtuous ones, birth and death are a duality, but nothing is created and nothing is destroyed. Realization of this patient endurance leading to the uncreate is a nation into non-dual dharma. 
uh, I'll skip around a little bit because there are, are untold numbers of bodhisattvas who weigh in on this. Uh, bodhisattva highest virtue said, impurity and purity are duality. When the underlying nature of impurity is clearly perceived, even purity ceases to arise. Hence the sensation of the idea of purity is initiation into the non-dual dharma. The bodhisattva skillful eye said, monastic form and formlessness, monistic, sorry, <laughs> thinking of monks, uh, monistic form and formlessness are a duality. If monistic form is realized as fundamentally formless with relinquishment of formlessness in order to achieve impartiality, this is initiation into the non-dual dharma. And we'll go with uh, one more here. The Bodhisattva direct insight said this inexhaustible and this exhaustible and inexhaustible are a duality. If all things are looked into ex exhaustively, both the exhaustible and the inexhaustible cannot be exhausted. And the inexhaustible is identical with the void, which is beyond both exhaustible and inexhaustible. Such an interpretation is initiation into the non-dual dharma. Anybody having any problem with any of that so far? Finding any issues with anything that they've said? After the Bodhisattva had spoken, they asked Manjushri, for his opinion on the new non-dual dharma. Manjushri said, in my opinion, when all things are no longer within the province of either word or speech and of either indication of knowledge and are beyond question and answers, this is initiation into the non-dual dharma. At that time, Manjushri asked Vimalakirti, all of us have spoken. Please tell us what is the Bodhisattva's initiation into the non-dual dharma. Parentheses, Vimalakirti kept secret without saying, kept silent without saying a word. At that, Manjushri exclaimed, excellent, excellent, can there be true initiation into the non-dual dharma until words and speech are no longer written or spoken. So in this case, and it happens throughout the sutra, where Vimalakirti, the layman, expresses a wisdom that the bodhisattvas, the, the Buddha's clergy people, if you like, didn't possess. They had an inkling, like all those bodhisattvas talking about the initiation into non-duality. They were kind of dancing around the outside maybe a little bit. They were, you know, still attached to trying to explain things, to uh, showing how learned they were maybe, or whatever it might be, whatever their motivation might be, they still found the need to use words to do it. Only Manjushri, when asking Vimalakirti about his take on the initiation into non-duality. I like to think of it as Manjushri is sort of throwing out the line and reeling it in and bringing 
uh, Vimalakirti up to the surface so he could actually give the answer, which of course was no answer in this case. So we have those odd situations where we think we have to listen to the teachings of a person because of their status or their title. We think we know stuff ourselves and find it very easy to possibly argue with them or getting in some sort of uh, flame war, to use the internet cool term. What Layman Pong, the Buddha, and Vimalakirti all show us is that titles and degrees, having DDS, PhD, uh, whatever, DVM, that's a doctor of veterinary medicine, it could be, I don't know. Um, all the letters after the name, the degrees, the titles, the levels of ordination, so on and so forth, are irrelevant when not in the presence of actual wisdom. Now, conversely, here I am sitting here talking for about 10 minutes, which one could argue was 10 minutes too much, and I'm just babbling, which may or may not be the case. But the words I'm using are there to prove a point that just because someone is in a position of authority, and this extends beyond Zen, doesn't mean we have to blindly obey follow or believe everything that they might have to tell us. So in that regard, as the Buddha's dying words were, supposedly, be a lamp unto yourself. I can enlighten you, you can enlighten me. Subhuti couldn't enlighten Shariputra, the Dalai Lama can't enlighten anyone. We have to do our own work, our own discovering of our Buddha nature. And then as a Bodhisattva, as the Buddha did when he awakened, we try and go out and help all beings and share the Dharma in order to do so whether using words or using silence.